Hi, this is Pancho Campo, and one of my passions has always been sports. Tennis was my profession for almost 20 years. I am also a scuba diving instructor, and in my expeditions I always do a lot of hiking and rafting. And recently I got my license as a skydiver. Why am I telling you all this? Because we have decided to dedicate a full chapter of the Planet Future documentaries to climate change in the world of sports. In this documentary, I will share with you the results of our research trying to answer the following three questions. Number one, is climate change really affecting the world of sports? Number two, what is the impact that sport has on the environment and what is its carbon footprint? And number three, what is the world of sports doing to help solve the climate crisis? We decided to start this edition of the Planet Future documentaries at a very symbolic place in the city of Marbella. This is the legendary tennis stadium at Hotel Puente Romano. Let's go with question number one. How is the climate crisis affecting the world of sports? And the first impact we have to analyze is rising temperatures. Because rising temperatures is the first impact of climate change. Hence the name that it was given many years ago to the crisis as global warming. Higher temperatures mean shorter winters and sometimes with less snow or poor quality of this snow. This threatens winter sports such as downhill and cross-country skiing, but rising temperatures will also jeopardize the future of the Winter Olympic Games. A recent study estimated that because of rising temperatures, only 11 of the 20 locations that have hosted a Winter Olympics would be able to host the Winter Games in 2050. Eight or nine of these sites may become too warm for any kind of snow sports. Let's also not forget that winter sports and ski stations are very important for tourism and a source of jobs and income for communities around the globe. Officials at the Summer Olympic Games in Japan had to move the marathons and distant walking events to the city of Sapporo, which is a thousand kilometers north and much cooler because of the heat wave in Tokyo. The Sochi Paralympics saw a six-fold increase in injury rates compared to Vancouver due to the premature melting and poor quality of the snow. Recently, I obtained my license as a skydiver and one of the days I mentioned to the director of the drop zone about my interest on climate change. He mentioned that in Madrid in the last two summers there were days when they had to stop flights and skydivers from jumping due to high temperature. When the air gets warm, the result are turbulences that can severely affect the flight of airplanes and the landing of skydivers. Hot air ballooning has also been affected in a very similar manner. A balloon needs to warm up the air inside to rise and fly. With temperatures increasing, flying is becoming more and more difficult. Diving is also being affected by climate change because a rise in water temperatures is contributing to coral bleaching and lots of dead reefs which I have personally witnessed during my diving expeditions to the coral reefs in Florida and the Caribbean. The impact of human activities on the marine environment is evident. Unfortunately, we constantly must dive next to discarded fishing nets, also known as ghost nets, and witness the impacts of trawler fishing on corals. Ocean pollution has become a serious problem, as you can see in this video, full of plastic, bottles, and even masks from the COVID pandemic. Also, the infestation of that algae known as sargassum in more than 30 countries of the Caribbean 
is having an impact on coastal areas and, of course, on water sports as well. Scuba divers are probably the only sports people that I have met who have taken climate change seriously and are actively promoting the protection of the marine environment. The next point we have to consider is heat. Heat and heat waves are arguably one of the biggest problems associated to the climate crisis. One sport on the front lines of extreme heat is cricket. In January 2018, England captain Joe Root was taken to a hospital during the match between England and Australia due to severe dehydration and vomiting. The temperature that day reached 57 degrees Celsius on the field. That's 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Extreme temperatures resulted in tennis star Victoria Azarenka collapsing during her second round match at the US Open and was rushed to a hospital. In the 2018 US Open, Novak Djokovic struggled badly with the humidity during one of his matches. In fact, the Australian Open has created a heat scale that goes from level 1 to level 5. When level 5 is rich, outdoor play is suspended, roofs are closed, AC is turned on, and the game must resume indoors. Frank Dansevich started hallucinating on court before vomiting and departing. And a record nine players retired during the first round of play due to the extreme heat. The 2014 Australian Open was played in the middle of a harsh heat wave that saw four consecutive days of temperatures above 41 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, the ATP, the ITF, and the WTA still do not have rules that contemplate heat-related injuries. The New York City Triathlon with the expected heat, it's been canceled. Mm -hmm. This is adjustments are made for many others planning to be outdoors this weekend. Athletes have been forced to change their training patterns, nutrition, and hydration as well as their routines in order to adapt and cope with the extreme heat. When temperature goes above 35 degrees Celsius and humidity rises, memory, eye-hand coordination, and concentration all start suffering, followed by heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and eventually heat stroke. This will affect not only the athletes, but also spectators and staff working at the different events. We also have to consider rising sea levels and extreme weather episodes. Because rising sea levels are flooding golf courses, beaches in many countries, and sport arenas next to seas and oceans. In 2019, the Rugby World Cup was disrupted by unprecedented Pacific typhoons. According to the BBC, by 2050, it is estimated that almost one in four English Football League grounds can expect flooding every year. 
In the United States, numerous football stadiums have suffered the impact of severe weather episodes. The roof of the Metrodome Stadium, home of NFL Minnesota Vikings, totally collapsed in 2010 due to severe rain and snowstorms. More than 450 years of golfing history at Montrose, one of the five oldest courses in the world, is at risk of being washed away by rising seas and coastal erosion linked to climate change. Chris Kernin, director at Montrose Golf Links, said, as the sea rises and the coast falls away, we are left with nowhere to go. Climate change is often seen as tomorrow's problem but it's already eating away our course. Drought is probably one of the most severe consequences of climate change. Increased temperatures and low rainfall can result in severe drought. The lack of drinking water will be the most worrying consequence of the climate crisis in a very near future. The prolonged drought in Cape Town in 2018 made it the first major city to almost reach day zero and run out of drinking water. Water use was severely restricted at all levels, but also at sports grounds. Many outdoor sports were canceled across the whole Western Cape. At an international cricket competition in Cape Town in 2018, the visiting Indian team and citizens in general were told to shower for no more than 90 seconds. Drought also affects river rates of flow. Lower water flow will have an impact on multiple sports such as canoeing, rafting and sailing, both in terms of sporting performance and the cleanliness of water. Let's now talk about fires, because higher temperatures, drought, low humidity, and massive heat waves are increasing the number of fires around the planet. Many of these fires happen next to golf courses, sporting arenas, tennis tournaments, which are suffering not only the risks of the flames, but the pollution of smoke and ashes. For example, in Delhi, in 2017, during an air pollution episode, cricket players in the match between India and Sri Lanka vomited on the pitch, necessitating the installation of oxygen cylinders in their dressing rooms and repeated breaks during the play. The 2020 Australian Tennis Open was played with air quality so poor that players were struggling to breathe due to the pollution that originated because of the fires and its smoke. In open preparations have been thrown into chaos by the hazardous smoke blanketing Melbourne. The thick haze caused distress for qualifiers, with one hopeful help from the court after suffering a coughing fit. Ayrton Woolley begins our coverage. Choked by the city's polluted air, an Australian Open hopeful crumbles. <laughs> Dalia Jakopovic dropping to her knees in pain with victory in sight, the Slovenians' qualifying campaign had come to a distressing end. Unfortunately, Miss Jakupovic is unable to continue. Let's tackle now question number two. What about the carbon footprint of sports and the impacts on the environment? Sports has a very high carbon footprint. The amount of damage caused by global sports carbon footprint and the other forms of climate pollution that a sport produces is equivalent to the damages created from the activities of entire countries, according to a new study. The industry must reduce its carbon footprint severely. However, to do that, it needs to know how much carbon is producing. No one currently knows and the research that has been done about different sporting events and institutions is not the most accurate. 
Sporting events are responsible for massive carbon emissions due to stadium construction, air cargo, and transport of athletes, officials, and fans. Large tournaments, sporting events, and competitions generate tons of unrecycled garbage and lots of waste. The 2018 Russia World Cup released 2.1 million tons of CO2, and those calculations exclude the impact of constructing multiple new stadiums. According to a report by British sports journalist David Goldblatt, there has been no shortage in environmental slogans in the sports world since the Sydney Olympics, but there has been precious little action amongst the governing bodies of sport and the leading professional and commercial league. This is also known as greenwashing. Stadiums around the world are built with cement, which is arguably the most carbon-intensive product on Earth. Natural grass also needs to be irrigated, and most indoor facilities require either AC in the summer or heating in the winter. What about motorsports? Well, the carbon impact of Formula One and other motorsports is huge, probably the worst of any other sports and comparable to entire nations. In 2018, it was calculated that the emissions of Formula One was close to 257,000 tons of CO2. But contrary to what many might think, most of the carbon footprint of Formula One and other motorsports does not come from the actual racing. Emissions from the car is less than 1%. Most of the carbon emissions come from the logistics and travel part of the sports. Because of the nature of Formula One and other motorsports, competitions happen in several parts of the planet with its corresponding transportation requirements. Thousands of people travel to each event, including pilots, mechanics, journalists, and enthusiasts. But most important are the emissions from the transportation of the vehicles, cargo, motorhome, and equipment in general. There is an initiative known as Countdown to Zero, which intends to reduce the carbon emission of Formula One to almost zero by 2030. This is a massive undertaking, and from my humble point of view, extremely difficult to accomplish. We're only seven years away. For those of you who claim that Formula E is already addressing these issues, let me remind you that less than 1% of the emissions come from the actual vehicles. Transportation and logistics are very similar as Formula One. Remember also that electric cars run on batteries, which do not produce electricity. They only store it. Unfortunately, to recharge electric cars, a very big proportion of the electricity still comes from fossil fuels. Other motorsports, such as the different rallies, motorcycles, indoor trails, motocross, etc., have similar patterns of carbon emissions. Let's take tennis as an example, a sport in which I was involved professionally and I happen to know better than other sports. Most hard courts are made from cement and fossil fuel products. The paint coating is also a derivative of fossil fuels. The use of plastics in tennis is obscene. Racket strings, tennis nets, windbreakers which are used in most clubs and tournaments around the world, tennis shoes, racket bags and covers, and vibration dampers are just an example of the many uses of plastic in the sport. In every tournament, players appear drinking out of plastic bottles. And after the matches, they make an appearance at the corresponding press conference with a plastic bottle of water next to them. Sports celebrities and event organizers should be more careful when it comes to endorsing companies and products. For example, look at this press conference. 
there are plastic water bottles imported from China and a brand of motor vehicles supporting the tournament. Not very environmentally friendly, if you ask me. And what about a brand of Chinese alcohol spirit sponsoring a sporting event? Do you know how tennis balls are made and what is their carbon footprint? According to a study by Dr. Mark Johnson from the Warwick Business School, to produce the Wimbledon tennis balls, the complex supply chain sees clay shipped from South Carolina in the USA, silica from Greece, magnesium carbonate from Japan, zinc oxide from Thailand, sulfur from South Korea, and rubber from Malaysia. Wool then travels from New Zealand to Stroud in Gloucestershire, where it's turned into felt and then sent back to Bataan in the Philippines. Meanwhile, petroleum naphthalene from Zebo in China and glue from Basilan in the Philippines are brought to Bataan where Slasinger manufactures the ball. Finally, tins are shipped from Indonesia and once the balls have been packaged, they are sent to Wimbledon. Believe it or not, the carbon footprint of tennis balls is ridiculously high. Our final question, number three, what can sports and sports celebrities do? But what is the world of sports doing to adapt to climate change? Most importantly, what is the industry doing to reduce its carbon footprint and mitigate climate change? Honestly, not enough and not much. Only a tiny fraction of the world's thousands of sporting bodies, federations, tournaments, leagues and clubs have signed up to the United Nations Sport for Climate Action Framework. At the same time, the car manufacturers, petrochemical and aviation industries have a tremendous presence and influence in sports through their sponsorships. Sport can be a very powerful tool in influencing and changing people's attitudes for the better. Sport has and promotes the same values, irrespective of nationalities, social and economic backgrounds, gender, and political orientation. The world of sports is in a unique position to be a part of the solution to the climate crisis. Sport is a universal language understood by all cultures and social backgrounds. Billions of people are involved in sport either as spectators, practitioners, event promoters, manufacturers, retailers, and facilitators in general. Sport celebrities can play a tremendous role to promote a healthier and more sustainable lifestyle. Athletes and teams can serve as role models to their supporters, particularly the younger generations. The world of sport, its teams, organizations, federations, its athletes, and all of us sport fans can play a crucial role in educating and raising awareness about the many environmental issues that exist about the importance of protecting our planet, and especially to solve the climate crisis.